Okay, so we are going to start with a red word. We're going to do visual drills. Remember, you're going to pull with the hand that you write with, and then you're going to tap and then slide. And when you tap, you're going to say the letters. All right, you ready? So you're going to load it. Load. Does. Does. Load it again. Does. D. Make sure you're going at the same speed everybody else is. Number two, load it. They. You ready? Load it. R. Beautiful. Load it. Load it. Load it. Nicely done. The next drill is auditory. So I'm going to say the word and then you are going to. Oh, it's the wrong pile. And then you're going to say the word and then you're going to look. Say it, load it, right? And then tap it and slide it. Ready? Word. Have. Load it. Have. Who. Load it. Who. Come. Load it. Nicely done. What. Load it. Want, load it. All, load it. As, load it. As, as, a, s, as. Or, load it. And that is it. So our new red word is here. Um, my dog is not here. Who can give me another sentence for the word here? He is here today. Good job. So... Let's think about how we would you or what sounds do we hear? Uh, let's pound and tap here. So you ready? Here. How many sounds do you hear? How many taps do you hear in here? Three. Three? What sound do you hear first? Huff, which is H. And what sound do you hear next? Huh, E. And what sound do you hear last? R. R. Now, the the sound that you don't hear is the last one, and E. May, it would be silent E, and silent E would make E say E. Huh? E or here. What? It is. It's just huh er. You're right. Good job. All right. So, um, so. The next job, you are going to be writing your word with the red screen and the red crayon. You need to put your name on your paper. All right, you ready? The word is here. Spell it with me. H-E-R-E, -E, here. Do it again. Ready? Here we go. Here. H. 
E R E here. One more time. H E R E here. Okay, then the next time you are going to put your red screen away. And we are going to load and arm tap your new word. So you guys can put your uh, new word in your left hand. So put your new word out like this in your left hand. Or your non-writing hand. And you're going to load it. You ready? Load it. Here. Load it. Load it. Okay, next we're going to trace it with your finger. Are you ready? Fingers up. Ready. Trace. H. Fingers up. Ready. Trace. H. E. R. E. Here. Fingers up. Ready, trace. H E R E here. I know, isn't that crazy? Pull your, put your, slide your paper away. Fingers up. You're going to write it three times on your desk with your finger. Ready, here. Ready, write. H E R E here. Fingers up. Ready, write. H E R E here. Fingers up. Ready, right. H E R E here. Nicely done. Now you are going to write the word with your red crayon on your paper three times. You ready? Crayons up. Yes, you underline it and say the word at the same time. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, red crayons up. You ready? He ready, right. H E R E here. Crayons up. Most remember to say the the letters as you're writing the word. That's part of the process, right? Ready, right. H R E here. Crayons up. Ready, right. H E R E here. Crayons down. Fold your paper on the dotted line. Zoop. Maybe. Surprise, surprise, Miss Richardson's on the ball. Pencils up. Pencil. What? Oh, yeah, pencil. Not the crayon, the pencils. Not the red bumpy screen. Pet, fold the paper. You were supposed to put that little guy away. Put your pencils up. You ready? Ready, right. Say it in your head. You should have wrote H E R E here. Did you get the underline? Excellent. So next time we are next we're writing our sentences. Woot woot. All right, so here we go. Remember, I say the sentence two times. You listen two times. Then you say it and pound it. Ready? Here we go. Is she here yet? Is she here yet? Stop. Ready, pound. Is she here yet? Ready, right.
Uh, yes. Uh, did you check your capital letter? Or did you check your punctuation? All right, next sentence. Remember, I say it twice, you listen twice, and then, then you pound and write. Just keep track of the time. All right, here is the path to the mill. Here is the path to the mill. Ready, pound. Ready, right. Check your capitals, check your punctuation marks. All set? Go ahead and read it first. Ready, read. Uh, on red words, you should. If you didn't, then fix it. Ready, read. Is. Should have had a capital I, a question mark. Underline the here. Number two, ready, read. Here is the path to the mill. Capital H on here, underlined here, cap or period at the end. Any questions on this? All right, put that away and get ready for Anne. All right, so our book, Anne of Green Gables, takes place in Canada. On a, in the province of um, Prince Edward Island. So this is a picture of Prince Edward Island. That's a province in Canada. Um, so this is Charlottetown. Oh, there's Anne and Gilbert. Oh, you will find out. So these are... Shh, these are some places on the island. Um, I just kind of wanted you guys to see what it kind of looks like, okay? You would imagine what? Um, mm, I believe you are right. So we are going to start out by writing some vocabulary words just so that when we start reading, we can just kind of zoom, zoom. Does that make sense? As I'm making a big mess over here. All right, so. Um, I got really good last year about having these ready to go, and then I changed them all. So I will have to get better at having these guys all ready to go. Okay, reputed is the character or status. So think about, so it's the character or status. And I want you to think about your reputation. Okay. Reputed, the character or, or status or your reputation. Decorum. And of course, you're writing these down, right? Decorum is pro propriety and good taste and conduct or appearance. Propriety, so propriety is like being proper. Propriety and good taste in conduct or 
or appearance. Oh, this one that they magically passed out because they read my mind? Is that what you're saying? Ferreted. So if you see the root, the root is ferret. And a ferret is a type of an animal. So if you're going to ferret, if a ferret would, you're searching out. So ferreted means to search about. I do not. Now, the cotton warped quilts. Are you guys done with reputed? No, I did it. I put the link in so I could show you a picture of it. I will. But I will. Just give me one second. So this is kind of, it kind of looks like this. So we're going to draw it, and then I'll pop you over to the picture. So it kind of looks like fans, and then it goes like this. Um, and this is an example of a cotton, cotton warp quilt. Um, it's also, you could also think of it as a bedspread. Okay. Um, and it was made with um, really thin yarn. So like it was almost like string or thread. Um, so it's thinner than the yarn, the really skinny yarn I've showed you. Um. I didn't think to bring any in, but let me show you. I have some at home, but I didn't think about bringing it in. Um, so this is, this is the, the examples they have. Doesn't it kind of look like the fans? Um, this is another example. If you turned, if you turn this one upside down, it would kind of look like the one we did. Yeah, waves or, mm -hmm. I've read it several times. I love this book. Mm -hmm. The green book. Not Anne of Green Gables. Love the green book. I already talked about that. I'm not talking about it right now because otherwise we're not going to get to even start reading, which would make me sad. All right, so gauntlet. So a gauntlet in ancient time, or like in the olden days, you'd have people on either side of this. And, like, if you would have to run the gauntlet, you, so these little guys are heads of people. You would run. Sometimes you can just run through one way. Or sometimes that would make you do a return trip. And you would run the gauntlet when you did something wrong. Sometimes they could throw things at you or, like, throw things at you. Sometimes they'd throw food at you that was spoiled. That's like run the gauntlet. So like if you're back in like Robin Hood or something like that, like um, knights and ladies in waiting and that kind of stuff, they might have a gauntlet. Okay. Um, the next one is an asylum. An asylum is an institution. That pro provides or providing an institution provides care and protection to the needy. In this case, they're talking about an orphan asylum, so. The needy would be people that don't have moms or dads or relatives that are able to care for them.
I don't know. This is like run the gauntlet. Okay. It's not a marathon. Usually it's like a short, short way, but I mean, it's not necessarily a good thing that you're running the gauntlet. All right. Dumb. And in this case, it's stricken dumb. But in most, in most places, it's just dumb. And it's not lacking intelligence. It's, um, in this case, it's uh, le um, unable to speak. So they would say you're dumb, as in you can't speak, or so-and-so's dumb, she can't speak, or he can't speak. Yeah, but, yeah. And back in the day, you could say that and get away with it. Today, it's not really appropriate, right? No, as in, if Miss Richardson was stricken dumb, I wouldn't have anything to say. Or I wouldn't be able to speak. Yeah. <laughs> That is a really good way to put it. Speechless, but more offensive. Um, strychnine. Strychnine is a bitter poison. You will hear about that sometimes in like movies or whatever. Um, it's a bitter poison. Sensation. Sensation is an awareness or feeling. Pessimism. Wait, wait, okay. We will, we will. So if you're pessimism or you're pessimistic, you focus on the negative. So like, focus on the negative or focus on the bad things. So like, if I said, if every day I was grumpy when I came in and all I saw was the terrible, terrible things every single day, do I focus like that? But some people do. You you know some people that are like always, oh, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and they always focus on the bad stuff, right? Or, yeah, like they're like, oh, I need a half cup of water, and they're like, like, the glass is always half empty. Some people look at a glass, they're like, oh, it's half empty. And some people look at the glass and they say, oh, it's half full, right? So, pessimistic is somebody that looks at things and thinks it's half empty. Ejaculated, which is to utter suddenly... ...and vehemently... So if so like the the thing I think of is interrupting. So if you interrupt somebody but instead of just interrupting like excuse me you're like are you kidding me right now? What are you doing? Like that's that's ejaculating, okay? And then the last one I have is uncanny, which means beyond Normal or expected.
okay? So now I get to read. Now I have a different book. My different book is for a reason. Ah! Because if I, you guys have a really teeny, teeny, tiny print. And so my print is not teeny, tiny anymore. Did you need that still up there? Pages 1 to 8. So this is chapter 1. Are all these words in chapter 1? Yes. Well, well, they didn't go into a gauntlet, but that's the picture image I want you to have. Does that make sense? Did you lose it? All right. Mrs. Rachel Lind is surprised. So, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to tell you what pages we're on because my pages are different, but I chose to use one that has a bigger print so it's easier and I don't have to zoom in as much. Okay? Mrs. Rachel Lind is surprised. Mrs. Rachel Lind lived just where the Avonlea Main Road dipped down into a little hollow fringed with alders and ladies' eardrops and traversed by a brook that had its source away back in the woods of the old Cuthbert place. It was reputed to be an intricate headlong brook in its earlier course through those woods, with the dark secrets of pool and cascade. But by the time it reached Lynn's Hollow, it was quiet, well conduct it was a quiet, well conducted little stream for not even a brook could run past Mrs. Rachel Lynn's door without due regard for decency and decorum. It probably was conscious that Mrs. Rachel was sitting at her window, keeping a sharp eye on everything that passed, from brooks and children up, and that if she noticed anything odd or out of, the, out of place, she would never rest until she had ferreted out the whys and whereofs, wherefores thereof. Basically, she's a busybody. How many people have you noticed, you know, that are like into everybody's business and pay attention and they notice everything? Do you know what I'm talking about? She's a busybody. Well, no, we're talking like kids that notice everything that's going on. Okay. There are plenty of people in Avonlea and out of it who can attend closely to their neighbor's business by dint of neglecting their own. But Mrs. Rachel Lind was one of those capable... Uh, she was capable... One of those capable creatures who can maintain their own concerns and those of other folks into the bargain. She was a notable housewife. Her work was always done and well done. She ran the sewing circle, helped run the Sunday school, and was the strongest prop of the Church Aid Society and Foreign Missions Auxiliary. Yet with all of this, Mrs. Rachel found abundant time to sit for hours at her kitchen window knitting cotton warp quilts. She had knitted 16 of them, as Avonlea housekeepers were wont to tell in awed voices, and keeping a sharp eye on the main road that crossed the hollow and wound up the steep red hill beyond. Since Avonlea occupied a little triangular peninsula jutting out into this gulf of the St. Lawrence, with, two wa with water on two sides of it, anybody who went out of it or into it had to pass over that hill road and so run the unseen gauntlet of Mrs. Rachel's all-seeing eyes. So instead of running through something, they're running past her eyes every time they come through. So she knows everything that's going on in all of Avonlea, like all of their town. Okay? She was sitting there one afternoon in early June. 
The sun was coming in at the window, warm and bright. The orchard on the slope below the house was in a bridal flush of pinky white bloom, hummed over by a myriad of bees. Thomas Lind, a meek little man whom Avonlea people called Rachel Lind's husband, was sowing his late turnip seeds on the hill field beyond the barn. And Matthew Cuthbert ought to have been sowing his on the big red brick field away over by Green Gables. Mrs. Rachel knew that he ought because she had heard him tell Peter Morrison the evening before in the William J. Blair store over at Carbondy that he meant to sow his turnip seeds the next afternoon. Peter had asked him, of course, for Matthew Cuthbert had never been known to volunteer information about anything in his whole life. And yet here was Matthew Cuthbert at half past three, so that means half past three is 3.30 in the afternoon, on, on the afternoon of a busy day, placidly, so slowly driving over the hollow and up the hill. Moreover, he wore a white collar and his best suit of clothes. So when do we dress up? Do we dress up to generally get in a buggy and go to town? You might dress up to go to a funeral. You might dress up to go to a wedding. You might dress up to go to dinner, a special dinner or church. But you generally don't get dressed up to go for a car ride or, in his case, a buggy ride. Okay? So he had his best suit of clothes, which was plain proof. He was going out of Avonlea, and he had the buggy and the sorrel mare, which had, which betoked that he was going a considerable distance. If he wasn't going very far, he would have done something else, right? But because he's driving the mare and he's in a buggy, he's going a long way. Now, where was Matthew Cuthbert going, and why was he going there? Had it been any other man in Avonlea, Mrs. Rachel, deftly putting this and that together, might have given a pretty good guess as to both questions. But Matthew so rarely went from home that it must be something pressing and unusual which was taking him. He was the shyest man alive and hated to have to go among strangers or to any place where he might have to talk. Matthew dressed up with a white collar and driving in a buggy was something that didn't happen often. Mrs. Rachel, ponder as she might, could not could make nothing of it, and her afternoon's enjoyment was spoiled. I'll just step over to Green Gables after tea and find out from Marilla where he's gone and why, the worthy woman finally concluded. He doesn't generally go to town this time of year, and he never visits. If he'd run out of turnip seeds, he wouldn't dress up and take the buggy to go for more. He wasn't driving fast enough to be going for a doctor, yet something must have happened since last night to start him off. I'm clean puzzled, that's what, and I won't know a moment, a minute of peace of mind or conscience until I know what has taken Matthew Cuthbert out of Avonlea today. Accordingly, after tea, Mrs. Rachel set out. She had not far to go. The big, rambling, orchard-embowered house where the Cuthberts lived was a scant quarter mile up the road from Lynn's Hollow. To be sure that Long Lane made it a good deal further. Matthew Cuthbert's father, as shy and silent as his son, oops, I skipped a page, hang on. If it's an emergency. After him, had gotten as far away as he possibly could from his fellow men without actually retreating into the woods when he founded his homestead. Green Gables was built at the furthest edge of his cleared land, and there it was that to this day, barely visible from the main road, along 
which all the other Avonlea houses were so sociably situated. So everybody else's house is close together and Green Gables is long, far away. Mrs. Rachel Lynn did not call living in such a place living at all. It's just staying, that's what, she said as she stepped along the deeply, deep rutted grassy lane bordered with wild rose bushes. It's no wonder Matthew and Marilla are both a little odd living back here by themselves. Trees aren't much company, though. Dear knows if they were, there'd be enough of them. I'd rather look to look at people, to be sure. They seem contented enough, but then I suppose they're used to it. A body can get used to anything, even to being hanged, as the Irishman said. With this, Mrs. Rachel stepped off out of the lane into the backyard of Green Gables. Very green and neat at, and precise was that yard. Set about on one side was the great patriarchal willows. So patriarchal, oh my gosh. Like a patriarch is like your grand, your dad or your grandpa or your great grandpa. So these things are huge. Yeah, so they they're old. These are old trees, are really old and really big trees. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Um, and on the other with prim Lombardies, not a stray stick nor stone was to be seen for mrs rachel would have seen it if there had been privately she was the of the opinion that marilla cuthbert swept that yard over as often as she swept her house do you usually go outside and sweep your yard that's how neat her yard is mrs rachel lynn thinks that marilla sweeps her yard silly huh Um, one could have eaten a meal off the ground without overbrimming the proverbial peck of dirt. So you can eat off the ground and you're not going to get any dirt in your food. Mrs. Rachel rapped smartly at the kitchen door and stepped in when bidden to do so. The kitchen at Green Gables was a cheerful apartment or would have been cheerful if it had not been so painfully clean as to give it something of the appearance of an unused parlor. So think about that doctor's room over at the, the museum and how prim and proper it kind of looked. That's how her entire house looks. It looks like you don't even really want to sit down in the house. Sorry, thanks. Its windows looked east and west, though... The, oh, through the west one, through the west one, looking out on the backyard came a flood of mellow June sunlight. But the east one, whence you got a glimpse of the bloom, white cherry trees in the left orchard and nodding slender birches down in the hollow by the brook, was greened over by a tangle of vines. Here sat Marilla Cuthbert when she sat at all, always slightly distrustful of the sunshine which seemed to her too dancing and irresponsible a thing for the world, which meant, was meant to be taken seriously. And here she sat now, knitting, and the table behind her was laid for supper. I just want to show you something really quick. And then it's lunchtime. I brought, I started a knitting project just so I could show you knitting. So here is... Here's my knitting that I started the other day. Oops. So you can see it. So this is what she's doing. She's got her one stick in one hand. She slips her other stick through the loop, wraps, and, and pulls through like that. That's knitting. So it's a little bit different than crochet. It's using two sticks instead of one. So I put it in the next one, wrap it, and then I pull it through. I'm not as gifted with knitting, sorry guys. A little slower. So I brought that in so you could see. This is knitting, 
And then when I get to the other side, then I'll show you um, purling. But this is the knitting stitch. Okay? Just so you can have see what she's doing. And hers might be a little bit fancier. I didn't really put any kind of whatever in it. But that way you can kind of see what knitting looks like. Does that help you guys get a picture of it? All right. Uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye.